Um, so, uh, so in Nationalized Merits, he argues why having this view that includes the racial contract, understands it as a dynamic in our living society, is a better view than clinging to the um, ahistorical abstract theory of the social contract. And he says that if you really want to ascend to some really high theoretical insight, you have to account for the real contracts, including the racial contract, and you have to perform the deed of ripping up the racial contract as part of your affirming some ideal theory, right? So if you're Rawls, the social, his conception of the social contract argues for two principles that have to be chosen in a, under the conditions of a veil of ignorance, where no one knows anything about each other, and no one knows what their position is in the society. That justice is when you can choose to agree on abstractions, right? Habermas says that justice is what you agree to under ideal speech conditions and what also structures the movement towards ideal speech conditions. Um, so this is all wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm good with Rawls and, 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 and Habermas, but it's very abstract. And um, in its abstraction, it really creates a lot of space for people to engage in a lot of mischief. Like denying, because of its abstraction, the way the real world um, doesn't mete out justice to particular groups of people who are the exploited. Um, so this book is preceded by a book called The Sexual Contract by Carol Payton. That book came out in 1988. This book came out in 1997. Is he still alive? Absolutely. <laughs> still putting out great books. Um, so by mixed race, did you mean he was like Asian and Native American? Or he's Asian, Asian and Hindu? He's Jamaican, and he's very light-skinned Jamaican, which, you know, most Jamaicans are like me. They're browner skin. They're not very dark, but they're mostly brown. Jamaica's like 90, 95% African. Um, so, you know, he's got African roots in him, and you see it in his appearance, but he's very light-skinned. He's privileged. He's got white skin privilege in Jamaica and somewhat here. So like Irish and African English? Yeah, probably. I mean, English, Irish, yeah. Because I'm Simmons, and my grandmother was Clark, and uh, my grandfather is Sullivan. Right? So... Um, I can't remember my maternal grandmother's maiden name. Um, anyway, um, yeah, we're all, we're, 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 the vast majority of us are racially mixed. Um, uh, I think that the, these are 1990s numbers, but 75% of American blacks, African Americans, have white forebearers. And something like 25% of whites in America have black African uh, forebearers. And so that's among the population of white people who don't think themselves to be black, and the population of black people who don't think themselves to be white. So, and then other races are, in terms of, you know, the arguments of some authors, to be understood as racial mixtures. So Latinos would, on Kant's way of arguing, be seen as a race created by a mixture of the, the family stock of whites and the family stock of Negroes. So they're a mulatto type for him. So... Hispanic? Yeah. Latinos are Latinos. I said Latino. Mayan. Mayan and white. They're, they're also Central people who are Native America. American, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... So, um, so this is the three parts of his book, and I'm going to focus in on his um, definition of race, and let me read it for you. It's a little technical, but I'll explain it for you. Um, the racial contract, this is page 11, for those of you who might have the big one. The racial contract is the set of formal or informal agreements, or meta-agreements, right, higher level contracts about contracts. 
which set the limits of the contract's validity. Um, that's what meta, I'm oh, sorry, I'm reading it badly, let me start again. The racial contract is that set of formal or informal agreements between the members of one subset of humans, hence, henceforth designated by racial, um, it, which is in quotes, and phenotypical, genealogical, cultural criteria. Okay, So there's a pool of things that might go into what we call race. He takes those criteria and he says, given any race, given any mixing up of that criteria, what, right? A race is, a racial contract is when one of those races gains a certain kind of view of dominance over others, okay? And so, to continue, um, okay, um, with the class of full, okay, to be, um, all right, he actually says he's going to be, so I gave it in a very general way. He makes it less general. He says white, okay? This isn't abstract totally. This is historical abstract. So he wants to take terms that actually signify uh, in the real historical record, okay? So, uh, Okay, so the contract is between the members of one subset of humans, henceforth designated by racial um, criteria as white and coextensive with the class of full persons. Um, to categorize the remaining subset of humans as non-white and of a different and inferior moral status. Subpersons. This is Charles Mills's peculiar innovation in the literature is he introduced the technical term subpersons with regards to the existence of, uh, of the concept of race and the organization of races. So there is the white group, and then there are the other races who are different levels or different manifestations of the notion of a subperson. They're not fully white. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, sub being lower. Yeah, of right. course. Um, subordinate, so they have a subordinate civil standing in the white or white ruled polities the whites either already inhabit or establish or in transactions as aliens with these polities. The moral and juridical rules normally regulating the behavior of whites in their dealings with one another either do not apply at all, at all in dealings with non-whites or apply only in a qualified form, okay? Um, but in any case, the general purpose of the contract is always the differential privileging of the whites as a group with respect to the non-whites as a group. The exploitation of their bodies, lands, and resources, and the denial of equal socioeconomic opportunities to them. All whites are beneficiaries of the contract though some whites are not signatories to the contract. So, it goes on to explain that the way you become a signatory to the contract is you actually affect structures in the development of history, as, as history is a developing thing, you actually affect political structures that secure the end of giving privilege to white people. And so, he talks about the histor historical record. He talks about the invasion of America and, you know, things like the rec Requiemento, which is a fascinating thing that Spanish conquistadors had to say because they were God-fearing Catholics. They had to say to the Native Americans, you can repent and accept Christ as your savior and you won't be killed, right? And it was this legal thing that they read to the natives. In Spanish. In Spanish. <laughs> and the natives, of course, 
didn't, didn't understand <laughs> what they were saying. So they killed them. Yeah. And then they, but they, but they were okay in killing them because they gave them a chance. Yeah. 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 So that's all in their own using, minds, of course. He's using that as an example of someone who is under the authority of a contract. He's not, words, they're he's con not the signator. He didn't call for the war. He didn't set the structures of the society in motion to get resources from this new land. But plenty of people bought into that project, right? For different reasons. But plenty of people bought into that project. Now, one point I like to make in the classroom about this is that you have to understand that, um, you know, people are, understand, are, are understanding their religion from a standpoint of their oral histories, not necessarily from the standpoint of reading the Bible and developing their own concept, right? They have their relationship with priests and priests reassure them about what's right and what's wrong. And their priests would reassure them that it's okay to do these absurd things that they did. Absurd? That's a very light word. <laughs> Murdering human beings. They had their choice though, because I mean, if they To read the word if they understood, they yeah. murder, thou shalt the not kill. Right. In a foreign tongue is pretty absurd. It's pretty absurd, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, really and it did absurd. work for them. It worked. That's great. So, yeah, you could argue that it worked. So it sounds uh, like when they have ministers at the site um, of an execution. Oh yeah. When yeah. people are executed, mm -hmm. but they have to have a religious person there. Just like you had collusion with the Catholic Church in Germany with Hitler. So, this is where he talks about how it's uh, an actual a historical actuality. He mentioned things like the Requerimento is mentioned on page twenty-three. Requerimento. Yeah. Um, the doctrine of discovery, um, you know, it's our land because we found it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or took it. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. It's really, you gotta, you gotta appreciate this. Square, we found it. Yeah. Yeah. We found Niagara Square. Nobody was using it. <laughs> it At is, the moment. the principle yeah. of occupation. And we didn't kill anybody. You know, we come into a land. We will, though. We can now. We come into a land. As long as we talk to them in some language they don't know. That's right. That's it. Oh, but City Hall would be easy. <laughs> okay. Don't um, put that on Facebook. Okay? <laughs> no, that's, that's a bit hard. He talks, he talks about how... He talks about...